when I do, whenever I do something like this, uh, whenever I talk to people, um, I like to hear, uh, I like to tell them my origin story because number one, it might spark some, give them ideas on how to uh, kind of get started in the industry. And um, also because it shows that I don't have shower, any special baby. talents or anything crazy that I bring to this that made yeah. me have some kind of uh, easy path um, for anything that I've been able to accomplish. So I'm gonna kind of give the quick version. <clears throat> I moved to Houston in 1997. Um, didn't know anybody here. My parents were in Houston, but that's it. So I, I got hired by the Houston Chronicle. I was there. I had been there maybe two weeks, and I met uh, a girl there who said, you know, hey, you know, uh, what are your interests? I guess we were just talking. And I said, hey, I'm a football guy. She said, well, you got to meet my fiance. He wants to be the next Mel Kuyper Jr. So this was in 97, um, and this is when – the internet's going like this and print's going like this. And so Troy and I started a print product um, in 1997 and we just did the draft and he took offense and I took defense. And we just had four publications a year and essentially we broke down all the players and we did a list and we did mock drafts and all those kind of things. So for four years or maybe five years, uh, we printed this sucker out and mostly stashed it in our garage. Uh, we didn't have many buyers. We're, we're probably paying fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars a year to to print this sucker, which is money we didn't really have. Um, but I started to go to all star games. I started to meet agents. I started to meet a few scouts. I started to meet trainers. I started to meet all these people that were around the game. And the message I got back was, no one. Everyone is starting these services, information services. No one's got one just for us, people who are in the industry. And this is about the time y'all might be familiar with Street and Smith Sports Business Journal. They had just launched maybe sometime in the late 90s. And so the idea of sports news being a thing was a new idea, but it was gaining acceptance. So I thought, hey, listen, I'm going to do a little market research and find out, make sure nothing's out there. And then I'm going to take it on the internet, which is crazy. And I'm going to ask people to pay on the internet, which is really crazy in, in the early 2000s. And let's see what happens. And so the first, so I, I launched on Memorial Day weekend of 2002, and I had done all this market research, and people told me there's no one else out doing here, doing this, and I thought that I was going to get so many subscribers that I was going to crash the servers. That's how naive I was, okay? So uh, we were charging $250 for a nine-month subscriber cycle, and so we flipped the switch, and morning of... Memorial Day, I woke up and we had three subscribers, three. And uh, by that was on Monday. By Wednesday, one of them wanted his money back. So we had two. Um, so it took me, didn't take me long to figure out this wasn't going to be quite, I wasn't going to have the server problems that I thought I was going to have. All right. So I cut the price back to 45 bucks for a nine month uh, cycle. Pennies based on what I thought I was going to be able to make. And we found a few ways to make traction. And so for the first six or seven years, I've got a service and essentially nine months out of the year, I'm more or less following the draft. And I kind of was, I was kind of one foot in and one foot out on what I said I was going to do. I said I was going to have a service just for people in the industry, but I didn't have a lot of contacts yet. So I did a lot of mock drafts and player rankings and the kind of things that you would expect from your garden variety draft service. And so we kind of toddled along and then I got lucky and I got uh, selected awesome. as a volunteer to run my first all-star game, at least the personnel side. This was the called the In a Juice North-South All-Star Classic. I have to always think about it because there's so many words in the title every year. It was in Houston. Um, it was the week before the Shrine game in 2007. So um, it was a lot of fun. It was a crazy week, but I didn't get paid. And um, as a matter of fact, my phone bill came back the month after the, ga the game. My wife hit the ceiling because it was like 250 bucks. So not only was I not getting paid and I burned a week of vacation that week, I had a $250 phone bill, which that was serious money to me back then. So I was angry. And so I started looking around. I got, and so I got lucky enough to get hired to run the Hula Bowl in 2008. So I took that job in July of, of 07 and thought, hey, man, answered prayers. I'm going to share 
no more inside the league. I'm going to shutter this dumb site and I'm going to run the whole ball for 10 or 20 years. And then I'm going to retire and I'm going to have an awesome house somewhere on the beach when I retire and life is going to be easy and wonderful. So I came back the first week of January of 08 and I think the first day I got back, my phone got cut off. The next day I got a notification that my health insurance was cut, cut off. From there, I figured out there wasn't going to be an 09 hula ball. So I kind of came back and felt sorry for myself for about two weeks, a month, whatever. And then my wife said, you know, when you started this inside the league thing, you said it was going to be for people in the industry and you tried to make it about fans and all this kind of stuff. Why don't you go back to the original model where you're charging more and you're doing something different? So I said, maybe you're right. So from, we, from 45 bucks for a nine month cycle, we went to $25 per month for a full year cycle. And I was scared to death because I'm charging so much more and now I've got to produce all this content and how am I going to fill June, July, and August? And it was going to be something that's going to really scare me. So when I first launched in September, I got about as much interest as I got the first time I launched in 2002. And, but, but the difference this time was people were enraged. They were like, how can you charge 25 bucks a month when you weren't charging 45 bucks a year? Who are you? How dare you do this? And I was kind of like, you're right. But I didn't have any choice because it's all I had. And, and I wanted to really see if this thing was going to have legs. So those people that were angry at me in September, they started coming back in November and December because no one else was doing what I was doing. I was tracking the industry. I was tracking everyone who signed with whom. I was tracking all the kind of things that they were looking for that no one else was doing. So that was 2008. Um, slowly we gained traction. We got, you know, we started doing different things. And now we have a lot of different things we do. And some of y'all are probably familiar with what we do. You know, we, ha we have the best draft award of the combine. We have multiple seminars of the combine. We have lots of people come. We have a Friday wrap that goes out on Friday that goes out to 5,000 people across the industry, pretty widely read. We have a pretty vibrant Twitter account that tracks scout hirings and firings. We have a, several different newsletter series that go out to different segments of the industry. And of course, uh, I have a blog that I, I write uh, once weekly, every, every week, talking about different issues related to the industry. And then, of course, we have the mothership, um, the site itself, inside the league. So... Um, I say all this because there were numerous times when number one, I thought that the great idea I had was actually a really dumb idea. And number two, I wondered why I was still doing this. Why was I still spinning my wheels? Why was I wasting all this time away from my wife and my kids and all those kind of things? Um, it's persistence. And I know that that is a cliche, but it's still true. Um, I'm gonna talk more about why I feel like I have had any success, any success that I've had, why I've had that later. But I, but first, I want to let y'all hear Matt's origin story. I haven't heard it myself, so I want to let him talk a little bit, talk about his career in the game. Thank, thanks, Neil. Uh, well, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Uh, I'm honored to be here, and I'm happy to help uh, answer any questions and provide you some insight as best I can relative to, you know, your career choice, your career path and all that goes along with it. So uh, with that, I, I will tell you that I did not uh, start out to become an NFL, you know, or work, work in scouting. Um, I fell into it a little bit. Uh, I, was, I, played, I played football at a small private Catholic college up here in Minnesota where I live, uh, St. Thomas, which if you didn't know, recently decided to go division one from division three and it's the first ever school that went to division one. And they're going to play football in the, in the Pioneer Conference, in the non-scholarship Pioneer League, and then basketball and other scholarship sports. So it's a big jump, uh, but it's not, not anything they can't handle. So from there, uh, there, were, there were a couple of St. Thomas alumni who had played at, at the Vikings, and I had made I, – I literally was sitting in my co head coach's office. Uh, I'm not knowing what to do. I had accepted the job as an offensive line coach at Vermilion Community College. And if any of you know where Vermilion is, you'll know that the only thing you can see from there is Canada. <laughs> so uh, it's about six hours north of here, uh, north of Minneapolis on the Canadian border. And, uh, you know, it's a great place, but there's nobody up there. 
Um, so I took, I was offered that job, but instead I decided to take an internship for even less money at uh, the Vikings. And from there I was able to matriculate through, but my first job there was in operations. I got in, that was it. Then I found a way to hang around and I was the first ever intern they had in Minnesota as a, at the, at the personnel office. And I, I was there two years. I worked for guys like guys, you won't understand you, names from the past, but if you're a football historian or, or you have an interest in, in, in the history of the game, the, the guys like Paul Wigan, who was, uh, you've all heard of Stanford. You all know the Stanford Cal, the big game. Well, you've probably all seen the videos of the, uh, you, you know, running through the band to win the game. Stanford winning the band, running. He was the head coach at, Stan, at Stanford or Cal. I'm sorry. It's at Stanford during that time when Cal won running through the band. So he was the head coach in Kansas City. I worked for Frank Gilliam, uh, who was, and Denny Green and Scott Studwell and guys like that. And so I, that's how I learned the business. And from there, I met a couple of various scouts that they had and ended up getting, getting lucky. But I didn't get lucky right away. I got, we, we didn't get let go. My internship was up. I kind of thought it was time to be done. They did too, because there wasn't just a job there for me at that point. And so I got, I, I stopped working and I had to find work, right? So I ended up taking a job selling, if you can believe this, uh, commercial produce in Salt Lake City, Utah. Now I'm in Minneapolis and I'm gonna go to Utah and, and sell produce. What, what was I thinking? But I lasted about six months there and I got a call from a guy by the name of Duke Babb who has since passed, who ran National Football Scouting, which is now the Combine per se, and it's run by Jeff Foster and some other things. So it's, it's matriculated from that. And they had a guy that got hired by a team and was I interested in a job and would you fly to Tulsa, Oklahoma tomorrow and come and interview? So I said, sure, I'll come down. And I got offered the job because some guys at the Vikings went to bat for me and, and kind of put their, their names against ahead of my, you know, put their name for me. Uh, they went to bat for me. And, and I think that's another part of the story uh, that I want to share is that you, you need to, you need to be able to communicate in forms other than text, Twitter, Instagram. I don't know all the other social media stuff that I try to avoid. Sorry, I'm not that old. I'm not, I'm not dead. My fiance tells you I'm pre-dead, not dead. I'm only, I'm pre-dead, not dead. So the, uh, the <laughs> that's another context. But anyways, from there, I work for National Football Scouting. I work on the West Coast. From there, I get hired by Green Bay. And I grew up in Wisconsin, and so it was an honor to go home. And I got hired there. I didn't even interview. I was offered the job because of my work ethic that they had seen. They had seen my reports. They were a member of the scouting service. Uh, I knew a lot of the guys. I lived nearby some of the guys that they had employed. And the next thing I know, I'm packing a, I'm packing a big green Lincoln and driving, the, driving from Phoenix, where it was really nice, to Green Bay, where it was miserable in the spring. So but I was going home. And from there, Green Bay, we had great years, Super Bowl years, Brett Favre, Mike Holmgren, uh, Ray Rhodes, didn't end so well, it only lasted a year. And then I got let go. And from there, I went to New Orleans. And then from there, my story turns about 180 degrees. And I had a young child, a young family at that time. And I said, I can't do this. So from there, I decided the financial, uh, the, 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 the financial, uh, how do I put this? The, the financial security with a young family in pro football in the world of personnel. You start adding it all up and, you know, it's a balancing act. What do you, what do you take? What do you do? If you're responsible, you got all these things to kind of handle, right? So I made the decision to come back to Minnesota where, where we were from and open and buy an insurance agency and think, well, this is now my life. I'll coach a little bit of high school ball after I get things started. And I did that for the, I've done it. I've owned it for the last uh, 17 years, 16 years. But in that time, I've also decided after about six years, seven years, I decided I had, I couldn't do it. I was, I was going crazy. I wasn't somebody that went to the office every day. I wasn't good at that. I wasn't good at going home the same route every day, back and forth. It was strange. I was not a commuter. I was used to, I could find a school, hotel, airport, next city, right? That's how I kind of <laughs> lived. And so uh, I even asked my wife at that time, I said, what do people do on a Tuesday night? I had no idea how you had a relationship because I had no idea what a Tuesday night was like. 
and they kind of, my kids as they aged and, and, and she did, they understood. And so I went back and worked in the Canadian football league, uh, back in, uh, I went back in two, I, I, I walked, I walked away from it in 2002 and I went back in 2010 and, and, and I've been back for the last 10 years in a variety of roles and different jobs. But to give you an idea of where I have been, it's, uh, I've been at the, I worked for the combine. I worked for green Bay. I worked for new Orleans. I've worked for the Saskatchewan rough riders twice. Uh, I was in the United football league, which was the predecessor to the former AAF and the XFL. And uh, I was the general manager uh, for the Omaha Nighthawks. And so I've been in a startup league. And then I went, uh, I went to Montreal for a summer and helped out there. And then uh, from there I got, uh, I, I didn't have a job. I, I stepped away another year. I just, you know, wasn't going to do it. And I ended up coaching high school football at an inner city school here in Minneapolis. And then from there, I called a couple of friends and said, hey, you, know, you guys got anything? And they called me back and said, sure. So now I'm in, now I'm in Edmonton uh, in the Canadian Football League. And it's myself and actually another guy in Houston, Bobby Merritt, who lives down there. And then some other guy and Brock Sunderland. And we're kind of the core group. But my story is different because I've, I've taken a unique route. But I also have known that I'm a better person and I'm a better scout for the route I've taken. And uh, I can tell you that at one point in my career, in an office in Green Bay, there were five, five or six of us that shared an office. And only one of them owned an insurance agency. The rest became general managers in the NFL. So do I regret it? No, not at all. Not at all. Am I a better person for the lessons I've learned? Absolutely. And I hope maybe I can share some of those with you tonight. There's a couple takeaways, guys, that I want y'all to take from Matt's story. Um, number one, now some of y'all are already working in football. Some of y'all are working at schools and y'all got great jobs and those kind of things. And God bless you for that. That's awesome. But for a number of you and for me, you're going to have to have something that pays the bills. And a lot of you will think, well, if I'm not going off and burning my bridges and saying, you know, damn the torpedoes full speed ahead, then I'm not being true to my passion and I'm not going to really give myself every chance. And I heartily disagree with that. When I moved to Houston, I had been in a job that was practically sweatshop conditions. And I got to Houston, I worked for what was called Houston Chronicle This Week. It was a small division of the Chronicle. It was basically an advertiser section. And without going into a lot of boring details, it was a very, it was like an oasis. <laughs> Professionally, it was like an oasis. It was like the easiest job I think I've ever had or ever will have. And it gave me the opportunity to, number one, at least get some money coming in. And God knows I wasn't getting rich. But it allowed me to get some kind of money coming in and gave me ample free time so I could figure out what inside the league was going to be and how it was going to work and all those kind of things. Um, and that's very important, y'all, because – I, I mean, I hope that y'all step into a job from where you are now and you get an NFL job and you're in it for three years and then you're a director and then in another four or five years, you're DPP and then maybe in 10 years, you're GM. God bless you. If that's your path, that's wonderful. But chances are you're going to need something to keep the bills getting paid. And I don't want you to feel like you need to apologize for that or feel like you're lesser because of that. That's number one. Number two I think Matt would agree, and certainly my case has been, as I've already shared with you, it's not that jet trip to success. It is trying different things. It is learning about yourself. It is making contact. It's building bridges. It's kind of stepping, jumping from stone to stone, really, and kind of trying to make it work and make it happen and stay alive and survive and keep your dream alive while you're doing other things. You know, I want to, I want to echo that. Yeah. Yeah. That's so true. So true. I mean, I've seen guys I, for you people that are working or at schools. I, I mean, I have seen coaches and I'm not going to name them, but I've seen coaches you see on the sidelines today as head coaches standing in a lobby, you know, with their hand out, not, not in a bad way, but looking for a job. Yeah. And, and they, they've had to, they built their name, but you know what? They got let go somewhere and they needed a job. And if you ever go to Mobile, Alabama, that'd be the most obvious place to see. You'll see coaches that you recognize. You go, what is he doing? He doesn't have a job. 
well, not all the all the seats are, you know, they don't get filled. Uh, they don't get to fill them all the time. Mm -hmm. So I echo that sentiment that you got to have a relationship somewhere along the line, but you also have to be prepared, you know, for a setback. I, uh, you know, a lot of y'all go to uh, the convention in January every year, and uh, y'all, a lot of y'all probably already know this, but I remember talking to a, a personnel director who made the job of, of putting it out there that uh, the school had a, a coaching position open, and the head coach was pissed off because he knew he was getting ready to go down to San Antonio, and he was just going to be killed for four days by people – kind of shove their resume into his hand or shove it into his bag or whatever. And, and that's the way it is. I mean, so many people, and a lot of those people are established coaches, established, you know, whatever that are looking for a job. So, you know, the senior bowl is that place, the NCAA convention is that place. There are other places. The combine is one where you're going to have that. Um, so those are all important points, but the one point I want to bring to y'all, and then I'm pretty much done with what I want to talk about is all of y'all are passionate about this, and, and a lot of y'all maybe that aren't working for schools yet, you're kind of trying to build the name, and you're using social media to build it, and you're, you're putting a lot of good stuff out there. I got to tell you, until I started trying to push my book, I didn't really know y'all were out there, and I've learned a lot about y'all, and it's kind of fun watch, reading y'all's tweets and that kind of thing. I'm not trying to diminish that, but there's nothing more important, guys, than going out and meeting people. Um, and when you meet people following up and making, building your network, your number one priority, it is so important. And I think Matt will probably agree. He has probably gotten jobs solely because he knew people and he had. Uh, yeah, that's, yeah, absolutely. They trust me. Yeah. And it's about building trust. Right. Right. And making those connections. Um, I'm, <laughs> I did a podcast this morning with uh, a friend of mine who's the, the, uh, NFL liaison at Rice. And so a lot of the stories you're hearing tonight, you're going to hear on his podcast if you check it out. And I encourage you to. But I have a friend named Mark Gorshak, and Mark's been with the Steelers for at least 20 years, probably 30 years. And when Mark still, even though he knows, I mean, he's forgotten more people than I've than I know in football. But when he goes to a school, and it may even be a small school, when he gets done, if he if he talked to the strength coach and the academic counselor and uh, the position coach and the NFL liaison or whoever else, before he leaves, he, he makes a handwritten thank you card to them. He handwrites the address on the envelopes and he even <laughs> kind of has his little flair thing. He goes and finds like a goofy stamp like Bugs Bunny or Tweety Bird or something and he puts it on the envelope but just because he's trying to, to be kind of light, but also to show his appreciation and be memorable toward those people. Now he could easily send a text or send an email or do any of those things. And that's not a bad thing necessarily, but when you put that personal touch on things where you have to go to a little bit more trouble, it's a lot more memorable. And guys, you want to be remembered. You want to be remembered in a positive light. And that's very important. So how do you go out and make those relationships and, and meet those people? <clears throat> Guys, all-star games are an incredible opportunity, and Matt's already touched on that. There are going to be people down there, but more, even more so than going to a game and being there, and, there's, and, and that's a great way to get started because that's how I got started. But if you can find a volunteer opportunity, you're gonna, it's going to be a tremendous opportunity for you. Shay, who's on this call, has been volunteering at the game that I'm a partner with. I'm part of the College Gridiron Showcase for years. And so Shay gets to go and – one thing you may not know about the CGS, we are aggressive about making sure that on interview day, when NFL teams need to talk to players, we make it easy for them. And we go out and, and you know, let's say you go to the Packers and they say, hey, I need this guy, this guy, and this guy. We've got 200 kids in a room doing nothing but waiting for the call. And so, you know, they'll send Shay down and say, okay, I need these three people. She goes to the podium, announces them, gets them, brings them back to the room. That's a great way. I know that Shay has built her name with a lot of these teams because they know she works hard. They know she does what she's supposed to do. She's not coming there trying to get autographs. She's actually in there trying to do a job. And that, if you can get that opportunity, guys, that's a tremendous way to do it. There are a lot of lesser all-star games out there that I know would be thrilled to have y'all. 
because you're passionate and you work hard and all those kind of things. And especially if you're not at a school already, I think it's vital to do that. And it's going to happen in January. That's, that's when most of these games take place is in January. But let's say you've got a, a job that you can't leave in January or in school or whatever. There's going to be, if you live near a major metro area, there's going to be NFL players that want to have their summer camps, go volunteer. There may be schools that are doing their satellite camps, find a way to get involved. Um, there may be coaching clinics that are taking place near you, find a way to go volunteer. If that's signing people at the desk, whatever. Go and make relationships where you can prove yourself to people. And don't expect to get paid. You're going to have to give away your talents initially when you're first getting started in this industry. All of these things are important. And I think they're all that you have to, I mean, it's a humble existence when you're first starting out. But, you, but until you have really made that name and built that network and you have people that will go to bat for you, it's really hard to be successful. I will go to bat for Shay. Shay knows this. I have never told her that, but it's true. Um, Thank you. <laughs> there are other people that I would. Um, you know, Marcus is on this call. Marcus is already at a school. When I talk to Marcus, his passion comes through the phone. Uh, but I know Marcus would still go out and do whatever he had to do if he wanted to move up. He's already in a good place. Don't get me wrong. Um, but my point is, we have all, everyone on this call, everyone that I've ever had on a call, everyone that I know did something they didn't want to do when they were first starting out because they're trying to build relationships and prove themselves. Don't ever feel that that's something you got to apologize for, guys. Matt, you have anything to add to that? Only to reiterate and, and tell you that that's exactly it. I, I want to tell you, I've been, in a, I've been doing this a long time, right? Somebody says, how do you know how to become a scout or how do you know what to look for in a player? And you, yeah, I generally do everything with a joke and tell them if they can do everything I couldn't, that means they at least have a chance, right, when they play. So, I mean – I, I, it's, a, it's a bad way of saying you got to know what you're doing. You got to have an eye for it. You got to understand it, but you got to see the players. You got to know the players mm -hmm. and you got to know your area or you got to know whatever, you know, be able to deliver an answer. But at, at the en end of the day, you never stop learning. One, just to prove I've been in a long time, right? Look, I just pulled out my car. I just, you know, got it. I'm not trying to sell it. I'm just trying to tell you, look, I'm 48 years old. I don't know everything, right? I'm not proud. But I think the most important thing is, is what Neil said, and that is, and, and I'll say this uh, as, as nicely as I possibly can to a different generation, go out and talk to people. Do not, and I repeat, do not be afraid to pick up the phone and get rejected. Do not be afraid to say to someone, uh, I I'm looking for work. And don't be afraid to call them again. And don't be afraid to call them again and again. As, if that's what you want, if this is what you want, do it. I guarantee you, someone's doing, not doing that. Some, some, if you want a job, the, the greatest thing about football is the game. The worst part about the game is the business. And, and in this business, people, people say they want a job, right? They want to they work at a school like, I don't know, Houston or Rice, or they want to work in the NFL or wherever it is, right? doesn't matter. And they'll call someone they know has worked at Houston or Rice. Or they'll call someone that has worked at Green Bay or they'll call someone who's working at Dallas right now. It doesn't matter. The point is they don't call directly. They, they don't even pick up the phone and call up, hey, look, uh, Brian Gutekunst, who, by the way, was my intern, which doesn't give him a lot of you know, credence. But, the, like, pick up the phone and call Goody. Just, hey, look. I'm calling for Brian Gutekunst. My name is Tim Smith. I'm looking for work. I got this, this, and this. You may not get past, you know, Sarah, the gatekeeper, but you're going to, you're going to make an impression if you do it enough times and you're going to have enough confidence to keep doing it. Because if we sit there and hide behind social media and we hide behind, I can say this out there with no recourse or nothing like that, you could have the best evaluation in the world. You might be spot on. You might pick the draft correctly. I don't know. But no one's going to buy it. You know, no team is going to say, well, you're out there selling it this way all the time. Why don't you come in and show us what you got? You know, you got to come out from the shadows. You got, you know, you have to. Because if you can't do that, and then 
when you get out of the shadows, when you come out and you're with these people or you're around decision makers, have a, have a, have a sense of, of uh, you belong, right? For a long time in the NFL, I, I was young. I was really young. I was, I was 24, I think, whatever it was. And I've got a job, and I didn't sometimes think I belonged. My first scouting trip was to USC, and I'm looking at Keyshawn Johnson, Daryl Russell. Uh, I mean, keep going down the list. I mean, there was – I'm thinking the next stop, I'm going to UCLA, and it's Jonathan Ogden. And I'm thinking, what am I doing? I'm 24 years old. I, I don't know these guys. I shouldn't – I mean, I could evaluate them and say, yeah, they're first-round picks. I mean, my mother could, and she doesn't even know what a football is. So the point is, though, that – you have to have confidence in yourself. You have to have a sense that you belong, but you also have a, have to have a sense of humility and humbleness and don't be afraid to learn. And for what it's worth, come out of the shadows, but don't talk. <laughs> I know that sounds terrible, but listen, listening is a component in our life that we are sadly missing in this world. And, and, and it's, you learn so much by just listening. And you learn so much by making a few errors. And then when you get a job or, or in the case of the guys at colleges, look, we need to offer this kid. Why do we need to offer this kid? He can do this, this, and this, right? He fits our program. He's a program guy or, you know, he's a tremendous athlete. Nobody knows about it. I don't care what it is. But by God, if you're going to recommend him or you're going to recommend a player or something else, stand up. don't be afraid to stand on the table and give your opinion. Because you may be wrong, but you're going to gain a hell of a lot more respect because you stood up for that person or you stood up for your evaluation. And so I think that's, that's kind of the biggest thing is, is for me, um, communicate, but also communicate with your ears. Listen, you talked about Gorsak. Mark and I started out together. He was a coach at Weber State. His, college, his, his roommate at Weber State was Mike Zimmer. I mean, they weren't making twenty five. they weren't making $25,000 between the two of them. And they're living in Utah. And trust me, those two are not Mormon. So they, they, they knew I had a good time. But, you know, Gorsak and I were on the road together. We do things and we, we're like, what are we doing? This is ridiculous. But we made sure to enjoy it. And I think that's the other thing. Don't, don't forget where you are because, God, it's a, it's a wonderful thing. But it, can't, it, 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 it can be taken away in a second. And, uh, and, and when it does, yeah, that sucks. It really sucks. But at the same time, it makes you appreciate what you have. And I think as you age, you become realistic and saying, you know what you're good at. And uh, I think scouting has changed so much. Evaluation has changed so much. I talk to guys that are at these schools and there's a couple, obviously guys on the, those jobs are fantastic. Don't think the NFL, I mean, the, yeah, the NFL is the penultimate and everybody wants to be there, blah, blah, blah. But theirs are good jobs. They are good, good jobs, and they're getting better. And if you're with a staff that understands the value of somebody that can do it, that's even better. So there's jobs available, and Neil just shared his story early on. There's all kinds of avenues that, that we didn't have when I first started. You know, it was go meet this guy, go talk to this guy, go to the combine, senior bowl, that's it, right? Go to a couple all-star games if you can afford it, and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> we didn't have the internet. We didn't. We didn't even have cell phones, for God's sakes. And then when we did, this is how old I am, really. I was out west. They, they couldn't find me half the time because there was no cell service, which in and of itself was fantastic. But, but you had, you know, I mean, so we have all this stuff, satellite radio. I would have driven for hours if I had satellite radio. I couldn't get, you know, there'd be states where the thing would just be cycling through on search. So, I mean, I'm, I'm just sharing these stories because I think what you have to do is you're going to, you have to realize that there are so many opportunities available to you. You just got to go out and grab them. And, and, and don't be afraid to be different when you grab them. Guys, uh, that's pretty much the end of our canned presentation. What questions do you have for Matt or me or both of us? All right. Yeah, um, oh. So uh, a decent amount of us on this call are – I don't know if Paul gave you the whole shindig that um, we're doing, but we, in an effort to build our own second step from going, we, we all have a decent amount of football experience. All were going towards second jobs and building up the ladder. But when the pandemic hit, a lot of us are getting furloughed. We ended up coming together to create this book 
with expand the box score where we're creating a 300 page um, player draft guide for this season. How do you think we should um, market this book to NFL decision makers? Because that's who we really want to put it in the hands of guys who can see our work and say, Hey, this is good work. We need to reach out to these guys and see what they know. I'll, I'll answer first. Um, Zach, if it's me, and I've seen people do this all the time, and I can tell you all kind of people who are in the industry who essentially did this. You mail it out. We're going to act like it's a typical year, okay? We're going to act like it's a typical year. You mail it out in November, December, and you put it in the hands of all 32 teams. And I guess in our case, you actually you turn it into a PDF and you email it out. Yep. Um, but you hit the directors. And then when it's all-star season, January, you, you get your butt out there and you're at all the all-star games and you know who you sent the emails to and you follow up with them and you get their feedback and you be honest about soliciting it. And if they tell you it sucks, you don't get pissed. You say, okay, how, why does it suck? Why do we improve it? Mm -hmm. You go to the combine. Um, you become the guy that every time they turn around, you're there. Uh, I don't know any other way to do it. I, I think that you have to be, you know, you have to be persistent, obviously, but you prove to them that you care when you're there. And I think all y'all have read the book. Um, Phil Emery, when he was a GM of the Bears, they would get resumes from guys who are like stocks and bond traders, 20 years in the industry. And they're saying, you know, I'm a successful bond trader, but I've always really wanted to be a scout why the hell didn't you go and try to be a scout 20 years ago? You know, um, you've got to go out and do it now and prove it now and pursue it now. Um, that doesn't mean you don't have another job. I mean, that I'm not taking back what I said earlier, but you, if you got to go, if you're going to go for it, you got to go for it, man. You got to sp spend all your vacation time. Like I did at the all at that all-star game, spend the money that you didn't think you had. I mean, really go for it because um, you know, if this is your passion and, and y'all wouldn't be on this call if, if it weren't, then you're going to have to do something and make those sacrifices and make it happen. Um, you know, I, I can't tell you how many people I'll, I'll meet them somewhere and, and I'll, and maybe they're y'all's age and they'll say, Oh man, what you do is so awesome. Can I work for you? And I always give them my business card and say, yeah, sure. Just email me whenever you get home. I do that because I want them to have to do one proactive thing to respond and to follow up to make sure that's not just their in initial fascination. 99% of the time they don't respond. That seems like such an easy thing, but they don't. So if you're out there and you are sitting here and you're providing your, your book um, and then you follow up and you give them a chance to know that you're passionate and know that you're there and have a chance to come to put a name with a face, um, that's so big. Matt, what would you say? No, I think you're off. I think you're mute. Nope. Went off mute and then back on on accident. Yeah, hold on. I think I did that. No, I'm good now. Okay, good. All right, sorry, Matt. Go ahead, Matt. <laughs> no, no. No, I would, I would add that, I guess I'm going to say this, expect Expect the unexpected. Expect to be probably at times disappointed. And finally, maybe don't even expect uh, any response. Don't, don't take it as negative. Do not. Don't. Don't. Take it as I did the work. I'm kind confident in the work, but follow up on the work, follow up on the work, find a way to follow up. Um, do what, do what you can to follow up, stick by that player, find out everything or, or stick by that guide, you know, send, send stuff like that. I can't echo it enough, but stick, stick to itiveness is, man, it, it's a wonderful, wonderful asset. 
and for the and and don't be afraid. I got a great Rolodex. I can call I can call probably thirty general managers right now and tell them to expect the book books. Right? They don't they don't want to hear it from me. They they don't want to hear it from me. They want to hear it. They want to see what I'll say. Okay, you guys put out a good product. I'll put my name behind it. Neil put his name behind it. Somebody will put their name behind it. Mm-hmm. Somebody's going to read that thing, and they're going to say, "Holy crud! Read this." This kid was right on, or this guy was right on, or this lady was right on. This guy, wow, what did we miss? Didn't know. That's and, what I'm trying to do. And, and by doing so, you, you have once again, to Neil's point, uh, you're unforgettable. Mm-hmm. I, you know, you, you, you're memorable. You're, hey, I've got something to hold my hat, hang my hat on. Because if you can do that, then, then you've got, then you've got, the, the door is cracked. What you do with it is up to you. How you decide to run through it is up to you. But for the love of God, realize that it is cracked. And that's all you need. You were talking one about getting furloughed. Other, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, one other thing, um, guys, we have a tremendous amount of uncertainty right now because of this whole, you know, situation. That's a tremendous opportunity, guys, because there's going to be a way that this is going to change the way the industry works. And I think it may fragment it. We may go to a lot more scouting services rather than scouts being employed. They may start contracting with more people. They may start looking for more. I mean, the whole world, the whole business culture is changing to where, you know, people don't need people in the office as much. They want people to work remotely. And I think that's probably going to benefit everyone that's on this call one way or another. I don't know exactly how, but if you're comfortable with a contractor kind of relationship with a team, you might be able to exploit that. Uh, you know, this is big, due to the fact that we've got this coronavirus situation. There have been a lot of things that have happened for inside the league that have become big, major obstacles. I was really kind of worried about that about three months ago. We've been able to come up with different things to kind of tackle things. We're having our best year ever. I'm not bragging. I'm just saying if you're small and nimble enough to take advantage of opportunities and you can recognize them when they're in your path, then – you may have a better chance to make your mark. So yeah, if don't, there's don't, don't yeah. with this, take it as an advantage. Go ahead, Matt. I'm sorry. No, I, I, I want to tell you, this is, this is, will give you to, to Neil's point and this uncertainty. Uh, the Canadian football league, we canceled our season, right? Can't had to cancel it outright. Now we still had a draft, but I got furloughed in the end of April. I'm still there. I'm still on the website. I'm still part of the team, but I, I know, but, they asked a couple of us, they said, would you guys do it? And I said, sure, I'll stick around. So I stuck around through our draft on May 30th. And I still stuck around. I still made calls. Now, I'm in a different position. I recognize that. But it is one of those things that you, you do because of loyalty. And you do it because of an opportunity. And if, if that opportunity comes and you say, I can do this for a while, or I can help you out, I want to be a part of building it back, then by all means, stick around, find a way. Um, I would say that this, to Neil's point of fragmenting, I mean, I've heard talk over the last three weeks that I've never heard. I mean, they're talking, I mean, there's some theory of maybe going to league-wide scouting, right, which is, you know, it. <laughs> I, I don't know how you become a decision maker when all you're doing is reading report. I couldn't do it. I mean, that, that's not the way you do it. Right. Um, the business is going to change. The business is changing. Um, I will say this, that in our instance, in, in our case in Canada, which, by the way, I could go back to the NFL. I really like Canada. It's a good balance. And you'll find that sometimes the balance is better for everybody. It, you know, your balance is different than mine. But I have, I'm forced – up there and we are to work harder with less because we don't have access or resources to everything that an NFL team does. So from when I started in the mid mid nineties to now, I'm still doing what I did back when I was a combine scout, but I'm doing it in a way that I still enjoy. So uh, I've got to work harder to find players. You may be at a school that doesn't have the resources of an Alabama or it doesn't have the resources of a Big Ten school. It doesn't matter. How do you find them? How do you get to the players? How do you, how do you differentiate your doing for your organization 
at that given time. And that is, is what, you know, will, will make or break you in this, in this environment. Not, this is total. I mean, it's so far off the radar. I mean, I, I, I don't know about you, Neil, but this talk at legalized scouting, I mean, that I've heard it two or three times, two or three people that don't talk, you know, that aren't really connected to each other just except through me. And I'm just shocked at something like that, at least, at least in the NFL, for sure. Well, the disappointing thing is that, and y'all probably have all heard, heard me say this in previous calls, when the NFL wants, when an NFL team, which it's like almost like 32 Fortune 500 companies, when they want to make cuts, because they feel like they should be making more money, it's always in the scouts room. I don't know why that is, but it seems like they always feel like they need fewer guys to go out and evaluate talent. And, you know, that's, that's mind boggling to me, but I guess that's neither here nor there. Because of Corona, we don't know how the All-Star game season is gonna work. We don't know how, if the combine, well, presumably the combine's gonna stay in Indianapolis and it's gonna be that last weekend in February, but we don't, but all bets are off guys, as y'all know. So I guess the get the book done on deadline, start sending it out, and then be ready to take advantage of whenever you can get any kind of FaceTime, whenever that is, and, and who knows when that's going to be. Especially if the, if the draft gets moved back to June, which I, I think June 26th is the last day they can hold it, then, uh, then things could really get crazy because who knows what's going to happen to fill in all those months. So anyway, I hope that answered your question, Zach. Appreciate that. Um, I, I just had one more about um, media guys coming in to scouting. I heard recently from a scout himself that 20% of his job was scouting and 80% was being a psychologist, getting in <laughs> to uh, learning everything about the player themselves. Okay. Um, and I'm wondering, coming from a media background, how do I accentuate the fact that I have that ability or that other media people have that ability to coax that out of people? That's great. That's a great question. I, at some point, you're going to have to be given an opportunity to provide a resume or something like that. And I think that's when your cover letter and your resume kind of mesh and you try to communicate that to whoever it is that you're corresponding with. Um, it's a great point and it's something that's really, I mean, I have a journalism background as well. It's really benefited me. I'm not a scout, but working in this industry, you know, there's just so many times you get a chance to figure out <laughs> what it is that makes people tick. And if you've got that ability, it is a benefit to you, obviously. Um, Matt, do you have anything to add to that? I would say that if you, if, if, and, and it's hard to do in situations where we can't be around everybody, right? Scouts can't go on the road. Uh, they, you can't talk to the players. You can't look them in the eye. And I'm telling you, you, you will know if you ever get in a position where you can sit down and interview them from the perspective, even in a high school kid, doesn't matter. If you can interview them or talk to them from the perspective of being employed with, and, and with doing what's best for the program you're working for, it will totally change how you look at it. It will totally uh, change how you look at that person. You, you will get, you, you can't get inside their head, right? You can't, you can't get inside their heart, but you can sure as hell ask them questions that get there. And yeah, there, there's a psychology part to this, but you better know people. You better understand people and you better understand how to adapt to people. And if you can't do that, if you can't do that, then, then you're, you're a step behind because good scouts can find players. Anybody can find good players, but how do they identify players that fit the program? And then when they identify a player from a, from a physical talent perspective, when they talk to that guy, they may see an empty shell and they'll go, let somebody else deal with the problem. I don't want that problem. But if you can read people and if you can adjust to how you're dealing with a person, then, then you are really ahead of the game. Yeah. A scout's job is psychology. But a scout's job, if it's all psychology, uh, I would argue against 28, 80, 20. I, I would argue against that. But I would also say it's probably 50, 50. You know, I, 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 there have been guys I've stood on the table for that I regret. There are guys that I stood on the table for that didn't have half the athletic ability of other guys, and I would play with them all day long. Now, you may not win with all of them, but you need, you need some of them. 
you need those guys. There are guys that stick around because of what they got inside and upstairs and not because of what they do on tape. And don't ever forget that because you need a guys like that in a certain situations too. What else you got guys? Hey Matt, I bet you I can, I can name those five guys. <laughs> in Bay. Uh, all yeah. I, I, I actually did an internship with the Packers in uh, 2003. Summer all right. Summer three. I was you there were there in the summer. John Eric Seller yeah. is there, a director of college scouting now. We we were on yeah. the internship that summer. Wow. Well, I'm so I'm so old. I worked with I worked with John's dad, so that just shows you how old I am. Um, but yeah, you you were you were there. So you were there. Was Nagy there, or was he gone? Nagy was not there. So Nagy so came I was there with it, I love Dorsey. Him. It was yeah. Dorsey. It was Dorsey Schneider, Gudekinst, Reggie McKenzie. Uh, Matt was gone. Nagy was gone. Yeah, and Ted Thompson. So and yeah, Ted Thompson I mean, was, the, was the GM, and then yeah. also um, Mark uh, Hatley was there. Yeah, Mark. Yeah, well, that's right. Hat was passed there. away later Mark, that year. God rest his soul. But yeah, that was those are. <laughs> we had we, it was an interesting room. It was a very very interesting room when I was there, and uh, we have, you know, they're wonderful friends, they're wonderful contemporaries, and I root for them every day. But. I didn't tell you one part of my overall story, and I didn't really even think about it till now, but John Schneider was two years ahead of me at St. Thomas. One, one year, whatever, one or two years ahead of me. And uh, John will tell you that he, that he stopped playing football because he broke, broke, tore up his shoulder. Well, that's true. He tore up his shoulder, but he didn't want to play anymore. Um, and he wrote letters to, to Ron Wolf incessantly, and he lived down the street from Wolf. And I think I heard somebody talk about rejection, right? Uh, I still have somewhere, not here. I think they're, we're, we're in the process of buying a different house and moving. They're in storage. I still have all my rejection letters from when I got done with my internship in Green Bay. And a couple times I, I've, I've copied them and mailed them to guys just to have fun with them. And <laughs> so, you know, awesome. you got, awesome. yeah, you got to do that stuff, right? Or, you know, telling, stories about what we've done i mean it, it's uh there it's, it's been wonderful experiences just just and wonderful people uh all over every league good stuff bad stuff doesn't matter you come through it on the other end the sun comes up and you go after it again the next day guys i gotta warn y'all i set this call for an hour when i set it up if this thing shuts off in five minutes then it's not because i i ended it's because it ended itself so okay. fair warning um i'm here to take questions until y'all are done asking questions yeah i got one Go ahead, so, uh, it's not much of a question it's so lately i've been i made a directory full of all the names of player director of football ops player personnel from d1 d2 d3 schools and i have them in my computer and i spent the last few days emailing <clears throat> emailing them reaching out sending them cover letters resume I've also been reaching out to my LinkedIn connections. And I know you guys said pick up the phone and call. Um, but I have set up a, a few, uh, maybe a handful of phone interviews, phone calls, just to give me some advice and stuff. Um, and like Matt said, I have the same thing. I have all my rejection letters <laughs> right here, <laughs> along with, I have like the yeses, the maybes. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Do that. It, it's such motivation. I can't tell you. It's just, it's physical motivation. <laughs> it is because it's right by my bed and right on my desk, so I have it all the time. Hey, I, I want to tell Neil. You can if these guy kid, people while while my you can give him my give him my uh, Eskimo Z. I don't care. Cell phone, Eskimo Z email, whatever it is. So, I, I just wanted you guys to know that that I'm always available to help. And don't be afraid to find a mentor. Don't be afraid to find a mentor. That's another thing. So Whoever that is, whether it's, whether it's Neil or it's somebody you know in another, uh, it, it doesn't even matter to this industry. I, I, you find somebody that can be your mentor. Find somebody you can bounce ideas off of. Find someone and talk to them and use them because the one gift we all have later in life is this knowledge. And if you can't use it, you're not doing any good for anybody else. So. Exactly right. Exactly right. All right. Other questions, guys? 
Um, I have one about uh, co uh, college all-star games. So one of my uh, goals or one of the things that I've been kind of thinking we could be, we could serve is we can help college all-star games with their scouting, but they probably may not have the uh, manpower or man error that a 13 person team of uh, 20, 20 year olds who also have like all of our methods and scouting, like scouting methods and scales. They're all, they're all the same for every person. So I'm with, trying to think of, um, I want to know how do college all-star games scout and how can I approach these uh, college all-star games and say, hey, I got a team of thir uh, 13 people. We're ready to scout for you. you we can scout loads of players. H um, how, would, how should I go about that? How valuable is what I've built here or what we've built here? I'll put you in touch with Jose, Paul, whenever we get done. Um, Jose runs the CGS. Uh, Michael that runs the tropical bowl. I know they could, they would probably love to hear from you. Um, the one thing that you find with these all-star games is they have a lack of manpower. And typically the scouting takes place not only this way, but usually an agent will call. He's got a good relationship with the personal director. He calls the personal director and says, Hey, I got a guy. And then the personal director goes and reviews the player maybe talk to a few scouts and then either gives a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Y'all would be able to provide kind of a, a wider net because of your numbers, because of the number of people you have. I should also add that we had uh, SIS come out and be part of our game two years ago, actually the last two years. Mm -hmm. And so there's going to be a familiarity with y'all given that you have that background will probably give you an advantage, at least with Jose and, and perhaps with Michael and, and some of the other All-Star games. There's so many of them out there now. There's there's the HBCU Bowl. I think the NFL is planning another HBCU kind of bowl, but there's one in Virginia. There's uh, the Dream Bowl up there that uh, Galco used to run. I don't know if he's still going to have any involvement there. There's all those things. If the XFL gets back off the ground, you know, that will be a possibility. I mean – I don't know if y'all entertain working for the AAF or uh, the XFL, but those were real small shops that could use manpower. I mean, use your imagination. But as far as the All-Star Games, yes, there should be opportunities. And I, um, I can put you through, Paul, with Jose. And Jose is one of the best guys you'll ever meet. He's never going to tell you, get out of my face, loser. I mean, he's a very encouraging person, very accessible. So I'll, I'll make that, that connection whenever we get done, Paul. Yeah. So, what else, guys? Thank you. Sure. Marcus, you got anything to add to this, man? You're director of recruiting at a at a BCS school. You got some stories to tell, probably some tips as well. Uh, a lot of those things that you guys were saying are like right on the money. Um, I know I, it's so crazy. I still have a massive desire to be in the NFL. Like it's, <laughs> it's it's still there. The passion is like ridiculous. Um, I did that internship with the Packers, what, 17 years ago now. And I've been in major college football on power five level for 12 as a either director of player personnel or director of recruiting. And that desire has not gone away. It's like, it's so funny. It's like, I always say this, so God put that desire in my heart for a reason. So I keep pushing for it. But I really enjoy the job I have now. The college recruiting thing is really starting to bother me now. And I talked to Neil about this a little bit. But um, the thing with the kids, it's hard to determine whether the kids love football or they just love being recruited. And that, that, that is a massive issue to me right now. Like we, 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 we get kids in the program and then you find out that they don't love the process of being a football player. So the big thing that I learned as a young guy when I was playing is that you're going to practice a whole lot more than you're going to play football. <laughs> and it's one of the very unique sports that are that way. You, you have a whole lot more practices than you do play. And if you don't love the whole process of it, you got, and it's hard to determine if a kid loves the process these days the way they are, way, the way things are. But that's kind of a massive issue right now. But doing those things that, that, that Matt talked about and that Neil talked about as far as volunteering or trying to intern and don't worry about pay, it pays off. I, I have a young man that, that, that I mentored uh, and he came, he needed an internship for his last year of, of, of grad school. 
and he didn't want, he didn't seek money or anything. He just wanted to work with us and kind of learn how the things go. And he did that at 22 when he was in grad school. He did a, a, a internship with us and he did such a good job that my head coach said, man, we, we want to keep him around when he gets his degree. So we kept him around. It was a really low paying position, but he grinded. He was in that, he was in the building anywhere between 14 and 15 hours a day, every single day. He did whatever anybody asked. He was just whatever. He, he did it. And, uh, but he learned the business and he got really good at it. Well, he, he just got the job as the director of player personnel at Old Dominion. You know, we got, he, he's, he's with, he's at Old Dominion now. And, you know, it's so interesting. He's 26, 27 years old. He's probably one of the youngest director of player personnel in the country. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but he did it. He started out with a non pay internship that he just bust his ass. And it's to the point where he did such a great job that you, you almost, you wanted him around. And then he just got better and better and better at all aspects of it. Uh, learned all the operations side, learned uh, the academic, learned everything to where he's basically running a department at 26, 27 years old. That's awesome. Yeah, CJ is a great kid. I, um, I call him a kid because he's half my age. He's not really a kid, but you know what I'm saying. Jalen, what about you, buddy? Anything to add on this? Jalen's at UAB right now. And has a passion, I think, like Marcus is in the NFL, but he already has some success. Jalen, what do you think, buddy? Anything to add? I would definitely. Uh, can you, Can you guys hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, I would definitely. Uh, you know, double down on what you and Matt said and Marcus just about uh, being persistent. I know. You know, I had the opportunity to have an internship with the Seahawks and. A lot, went through a lot of rejections, man, a lot of, uh, I think I went to the Senior Bowl three years straight, uh, going to the Combine, but I mean, it all, all, all that, all that, uh, that, that footwork, I like to call it footwork, when people ask me what, what I mean by footwork, I say, man, my feet be moving, that's all I know, I'm, I'm walking around this place, walking around that place talking to this person, but my feet be moving. That's all I can tell you. You know what I'm saying? But it all paid off, man. Uh, all the relationships that I was able to uh, form and still, you know, still actively uh, using and, um, you know, constantly refreshing. I think the biggest thing for me is that I've learned is when you're making relationships is to, you know, make relationships to, to, to know who a person is and not really to get something from them. Mm -hmm. And I feel like if people know that, you know, you'll, you'll get to that point where you can ask, you know, Hey, like, you know, if you guys got some, or, you know, you know, if anything, or, you know, you guys got opportunity, can you let me know? But I think once you really, once a person figure out who you are, just like as a scout, I mean, they're scouting player, they going to scout you, you know what I'm saying? So, if, if they can see, you know, the internal and the passion or your, the heart that you have, I think, man, it's, it's, I think it's, it's, it's easy from there because at that point it's just about the opportunity, you know? And so I just encourage everybody, man, and like Neil always say, be persistent, um, keep your faith high and um, keep at it, man. Like it's, it's there for the taking. Yeah, you know, guys, I, I would also add that uh, if we have a senior bowl this year, um, usually you can find Matt and I both in the end, same end zone. I don't know why that is, but um, I usually sit behind the goalposts um, in the end zone when you first come into LAD. Now it'll be different now, now that it's not going to be in LAD anymore. But, um, you know, if y'all go. They still have an end zone in South Alabama now. Well, <laughs> they, they still, right when you walk in, they, they, they built an end zone seat. It's not that's on the record set true. like lad, but we can get on we can get on metal again, man. That's true. That's true. Uh, I mean, people go, and especially when I first went to the Senior Bowl, man, I wanted to watch every play. I wanted to, you know, I really don't even hardly point at the field anymore because it's more of a networking opportunity for me. But if y'all do come to Mobile, if we have a, a Senior Bowl, um, just come sit by me, and I'll make introductions because there'll be a lot of people that come up. Not everyone is going to be able to help you. Not everyone you're going to think is even that important. But you never know when you build a, make a relationship with someone in football how you know, it's like that six degrees of separation thing. There's almost always someone that they know that can benefit you if you just take the time to get to know them. So I make that invitation to everyone on this call. Come sit by me, and um, I'll make introductions and uh, try not to bore you. But uh, 
especially if it's sunny and it's nice in Mobile, there's worse places to be than sitting in the end zone, being in a football environment, meeting people, shaking hands, and, you know, hand out business cards and that kind of thing. Especially if you live in Minnesota. I'm not, you can tell the guys that work at Northern Places, they're always in shorts. They don't, they don't care. <laughs> they're just happy to be in, in something that isn't snowbound. So, <laughs> so. <laughs> you, you can appreciate what we're saying then. Yeah, Very good. Sure. Very good. Very good. <laughs> Sometimes it gets a little chilly in Mobile. Um, it does uh, never gets chilly, Neil. It never gets chilly. <laughs> I'm in Houston. It's, my it's, a lot it's, than Jan me. it's January, and you can see open water. We don't see open water here till May, man. Trust me. That's true. That's true. I guess different perspectives. Um, other questions, guys? Anything else? Yeah. So I have one. Oh, uh, who's that? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Tim? Go ahead, Tim. Oh, yeah. So um, this is a bit more on the, the personal side of things. Um, when you guys, uh, you know, first started coming up and, you know, first started doing all your opportunities, uh, how did you manage, um, you know, your personal relationships and like uh, family and that kind of stuff? It's a great question. Uh, I'll take it first, Matt. I was, you know, I was fortunate because um, my partner in the first little venture that I described, when he got started with it, he... Um, he essentially did it until he got married and then he got married and he did another year or so, but his wife was like, listen, this wasn't our deal. Okay. Let's get a job. Let's have a regular life. Let's know what we're going to do on Tuesday nights. Like what Matt said. Um, it was different for me when I met my fiance, who's now my wife. Um, I, <laughs> football kind of came with a package. I mean, I was kind of like, listen, I'm going to try to do this. I'm going to try to figure it out one way or another. Um, I mean, God bless her. She didn't marry me for my money anyway. So she was willing to kind of wait on me and, and let me figure things out and those kind of things. Um, I was blessed because I didn't have to put off those family relationships. And I know that there are people that wrestle with that. Um, and it's a valid concern. It's a valid issue. Uh, if, if it's me, I mean, if I hadn't met Polly, again, that was a God thing. But I was 29 when I met Polly. Um, y'all, a lot of y'all are a good bit younger than that. So you got a lot of years to hustle before you worry about taking a relationship seriously. Now, if I had met her when I was 22, I probably still would have, I mean, one way or another, I would have tried to figure it out and I would have, you know, still married her or still at least wanted to. I don't know how there isn't, to me, there's not a pat answer on what do you do to manage all this stuff? I guess the one thing I would say is if you're going to pursue this and you have a serious relationship you've got to establish quickly that this is where you want to be and this is what you want to do and this is how you see things evolving and maybe even try to put a timetable on it because you want to be honest with this person this is someone you care about and you don't want to be still pursuing it when you're 60 um you know if it's if it's to the detriment of your family members friends lifestyle etc cetera, etc cetera. so that's what i would say about it matt what do you say man I, I wholeheartedly concur that it's got to be part of the package. I'm in a, four, you know, I, I left after I got married the first time and, uh, you know, I'm now divorced, but that's something entirely different. And that's, that's the way life works. And now I've met a wonderful person and we, uh, we've been engaged for a month and, you know, so. Congratulations. She, Congratulations. She, yeah. Thank you. She, I, I, yeah, yeah. I, I'm a little shocked, but she said, yes. Um, so uh, they, to that, to Neil's point though, they, she understood that I, it's going to be part of my life and it's, it's, it may not, it's not always normal. It's not always, um, you know, easy, you know, it's, it's, and there's gotta be a lot of trust, you know, in that respect. The other piece of it is that, uh, there has to be, um, uh, how do I put it? I'm trying to think of the right words. There has to be buy-in. And I don't know if, you know, I don't know if the guys who work at schools are married or anything like that. It, there's got to be buy-in because they're as much a part of it as you are. Um, and then I was talking to like these, you know, there's an, <laughs> I was, I was talking to a guy two days ago or a day ago, doesn't matter. Uh, and he said, I said, what do you, he said, I'm going crazy. I said, why? He said, I'm not supposed to be here. You know, it's, uh, it's the end of September and it's a Wednesday. I'm supposed to be hit, you know. Uh, uh, wherever I don't even—it doesn't matter. Montana could be any. The point being, 
you know, he's he, he's getting used to being all. And I think they get on a schedule. They're like, well, dad or my husband's gone for part, part of nine months. And what the, what the hell is he doing here? You know, he's not here. He shouldn't be taking me to school. I don't understand this. So we're all kind of dealing with that same scenario. And the same situation can happen when you're when you, when you get let go, and maybe you don't find a chair to sit down in and work again, work again for a little bit. You know, Marcus may be able to, and, and the guy enjoy. They can talk about it. You, I don't know how long you've been at UAB, but that same situation where they shut the program down, Dylan and and Marcus. If you don't have a job, and all of a sudden Saturdays come up or Sundays come up, the last thing you want to do is watch a game. For God's sakes, it's hard, but you gotta you gotta figure it out, and you gotta have a partner in it. Uh, what else? Appreciate it. What else, guys? Yeah. Any, anything else? I had a question. Sure. I can you hear me. Yeah, absolutely. Is this Brandon? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, man. Yeah, I have a uh, question for both you and Matt. Um, I'm currently working um, part time for my regular job um, as a slash uh, volunteer uh, position per se for a scouting company, helping to scout players for indoor teams. Okay. Uh, what? Uh, what would, would, would be your suggestion about contacting um, CFL teams about being like a scouting assistant or even uh, doing volunteer scouting and eventually working your way up to be in, being an area scout or regional scout? I'm going to turn this over to Matt because I don't have as much experience with the CFL. The one thing I will say is they are – my impression has been they are much more open to volunteers and people who are willing to pitch in because – their staffs are more like staffs of two where NFL teams have staffs of 10, 12, you know, what have you. But with that said, I'm just going to turn it over to Matt. Yeah. I mean, we're always on the hunt for, I, I think the term they use in Canada a lot is bird dog. And, and that's a bad term because it comes from baseball because I don't want somebody to just call me up and tell me to go look at a guy. I want somebody to call me up and say, there's a reason you need to look at this guy. Uh, yeah. And I think the CFL has a little bit more flexibility in that, we are, uh, we we aren't a large staff. At that point, we're three guys right now. We might be four after we go back in January. I, I don't know when we're going back right away, but I got we have a call about it tomorrow. The point is 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 uh, yeah, there's always opportunities. It's what you do with those opportunities. I mean, if you were to call me and say, hey, could you guys use somebody? I'd say, sure, send me some. You know, we'll take a look at what you have to offer, and maybe we'll maybe we could use you in a certain situation. A lot of times. Uh, uh, we we have we have a struggle because down here in the you know there's Canadian high school football right and and Marcus can attest to this the best players come here right they come down to play NCAA ball and and there's several of them uh, but but there's still colleges up there that we have to draft from and because of that we have a ratio and but most of the players come from the states and we can't I'm in Minneapolis Bobby's in Houston. You know, in Brox and Edmonton. I mean, for we we can't just you know I can't go everywhere and I can't do everything. So I have to rely on my resources and my people, the, the contacts I have, and I have to rely on you know what to some degree TV scouting, which is a bad way to do it. But I would never say give a final report on a kid I saw on TV. But I'll if I see something happening on a field on a Saturday, I'll I'll write it down and go back and look look back at it. So yeah, we we have a lot of opportunities. I think I think we can have a lot of opportunities if it's the right situation and the right team. I can't speak specifically to Edmonton because that's not my 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 job. But if that's the route you want to go, then then yeah, pursue it because a lot there's guys that there's guys in the NFL that have gone to Canada. They have worked for a couple of years, three years. They know somebody back down here, and they go back and become an area scout, right? So there's that opportunity. It's it's all about kind of this. You know, I have, I tell people I have all these circles of friends, you know, so yeah, there's opportunities everywhere because it, if you're, if you're willing to be creative, you're willing to be a little different and think outside the box. Yeah. By all means, make, make inroads, call the general managers, call guys because we're all sitting here right now. We got, we, we don't know what we're going to do and we don't know how we're going to handle it, but we got to play a game in five months in May. So, or we got to go to camp, excuse me, in June. So. Uh, and have a draft in May, apparently, but <laughs> we're going to do it, so we'll figure it out. I, uh, Brandon, I like the way you're thinking, though. You could, it's a lot mm -hmm. easier to lily pad if you can get in with someone with a place that needs you. Um, and like Matt said, you know, you might meet someone who winds up 
helping you get back down south and getting an NFL gig. Uh, and there are definitely guys there in the league now that started off up there, or started somewhere else, even started with an arena league team. Right. I'm tr- I'm think trying to be creative because I know uh, based on what I've read in your book and what I already knew, I'm already at a disadvantage on paper due to my age and uh, my family situation. But I'm thinking that what I'm doing now, I could use that to possibly um, get a start um, scouting in the CFL and possibly turn that into a scouting job in the NFL. And if that doesn't work, possibly uh, taking a personnel position in, co- at a, in college. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Listen, guys, these personnel positions in college, there's a lot of times I'll recommend – you guys that already have college jobs, don't go to the NFL because you're already making 50, 60, 70, sometimes six figures, and you don't have to travel all the time, and you get to evaluate players. And um, that's a great deal. And these DPPs, and, and now in colleges, they're starting to have general managers. They're making – He's the staff, whatever they call them, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they're making 100, 200. Some of them are making 400. That's a lot of money, and it's not a you bad You're going to make it as an area scout. I can guarantee you that. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. Not Here's something. Know. Can I share this? I'm going to share one thing with them. Sure, man. Back in 1997, something like that, my first NFL job was with the Combine. My first salary was a two, it was a two-year contract. I got paid, and I'm not kidding you, $28,000 a year. <laughs> that doesn't surprise me at all. That doesn't surprise me at all. Now, some of that was due to the the relative cheapness of Duke Fab. But my next year, I got 31. So I really felt good about myself. The Niners asked me for a recommendation on a guy two years ago. And they were going to pay him $15 an hour in San Francisco, the most expensive city in North America. And you know what the the comeback was? Well, we're going to give him lots of hours, lots of overtime. I don't care how much overtime you give me at $15 an hour in San Francisco. I'm going to be living in a box, man. Um, now, if you're passionate about it and you just want to get your foot in the door, you take the job. The guy that I recommended didn't take the job, so which made me – And if you, have an aunt, if you have an aunt, a cousin, an uncle, or anyone in your family tree, take the job, and you yeah. can afford to do it. Yeah. Because you got yeah. some place to live. I mean, I, I don't think I tell this story in the book, but – when I was, this was in the 90s, and long story short, I got an opportunity to be the media relations intern for the Saints. The Saints are my passion, baby. I was born in, born in the bayou. I'm a big Saints fan. Anyway, I went down and interviewed, and they're like, listen, man, you did great on the interview, but we had a chance to hire, make our previous intern full-time. We don't have that position anymore. You could be a business uh, intern, which means <laughs> calling, cold calling people and begging them to buy tickets, and that scared me. I was like, ah, I, don't, I can't do that. I'm going to go back to my low-paying journalism job. But I always think about what if I had taken that? Because you get your foot in the door. Now you prove yourself. You're, you're down there. I was going to – I was gonna. I had a friend of a family who was trying to sell a house in New Orleans. The real estate market in New Orleans was crap back then. I was going to live in an unfurnished house. I can't remember what the stipend was. It was like $800 a month, something like that. I guess I was going to flip burgers when I wasn't trying to sell, desperately sell tickets. I don't know what I was going to do, but you know, that was my kind of my game plan. I didn't go through with it, but you know, you just got to get your foot in the door. Any last questions guys? Yeah, I got one. Um, go ahead, Zach. So, all right. So number one, um, in the book, it's kind of like a side note in the book, you talked about um, the, the debate between Jared Goff and Carson Wentz coming out of the draft and how, there was a lot of differing opinions on golf because he was, you know, a late round draft pick the year before, and then he skyrockets to number one. I want to, I'm interested in what the difference was if there was one between what golf was in 2016 versus what Burrow was coming into the draft. Like was Burrow's year just so dominant that people couldn't refuse because, you know, he kind of had the same meteoric rise, so to speak. It was just that, you know, unprecedented levels. So your, your question is, how did these guys go from essentially late rounders to the first pick overall? What made them special in that way? Yeah, and, and if there were any differences between teams looking at 
Jared Goff and, and were kind of indecisive on him versus people kind of all in on Joe Burrow? I mean, I don't even know if I can answer that, uh, Zach. Um, there's, you know, obviously 32 teams. But, you know, it does seem like there was a pretty clear consensus on Burrow. Um, there wasn't quite the same consensus on Goff. I mean, you know, as you recall, it was Goff and Wentz were kind of 1A, 1 and 1A. Um, I don't know exactly what the answer is there. I know that those guys both had meteoric rises. They had great last seasons in college. Uh, they came out of offenses that, for the most part, were trusted um, and just had a body of work. Now, with um, with the Eagles quarterback, as I recall, he was a senior and went to the Senior Bowl. And that's where he kind of submitted his place. Goff, obviously, was a junior. He came out early and those kind of things. Um, Brady, I think – you know, he had more than one year. He had two years in LSU, but that elevation from his junior year to his senior year and the fact that they set records and had a season for the ages, I think made him really just such an easy pick. And I think he's kind of so far so good with his career in, in Cincinnati as well. I don't know if that answers your question or not, Zach. That's just my impression. Matt, what are your thoughts there? Uh, boy. <laughs> You know, they're, they're not so totally dissimilar guys in terms of how they play the game and how they approach. Um, I think about both of them having a little bit of a chip on their shoulder. Wentz, not because it's, he played at NDSU and they won four national championships when he was there, but because he was at NDSU and people didn't maybe think he could do it. Then you get a guy like Burrow who says – well, I'm at Ohio State. What the hell? They can't, you know, and that's Urban Meyer. Isn't, isn't Urban the, the whisperer, so to speak? So, I mean, the point is, is even Urban Meyer doesn't get it right all the time. Doesn't mean Jalen Hurts uh, was a bad quarterback. It, it just means Jalen fit better for Ryan Day and Urban. And, you know, Mark is going to test with being in Maryland and seeing it, right? So, so Urban, Urban, I have a very, I have a very good relationship with Urban, but like, like, oh, honestly, Urban, Urban didn't start two guys that went number one in the draft at quarter. Right. (laughs) But he won't tell you that on Fox Saturday. Let's just be honest about it. He didn't start, he didn't start uh, Cam Newton over Tim Tebow, and he didn't start Joe Burrow. (laughs) Over, over uh, Dwayne Haskins. But, so, but, so. but that also shows his knowledge of quarterbacks at the end of the day. He had such talent there at that position. But back to your question originally. Goff, Goff played for another whisper, you know, a little bit. And, Ted, you know, he, he comes from a place that Jeff Tedford was at. And Jeff Tedford's one of the, you know, when Ted went back there and, 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 and you know, then he went to Fre- – I think he just resigned from Fresno because he was tired and worn out. But – the point is they've played in programs where historically they've had good coaching. They've had uh, uh, well-rounded development. And I think they all play with this idea that I can be better than them. If I don't have to talk about it, I don't have to, sh- I, my, my play on the field will show them. So at the end of the day, are they all different? Yeah, they're all different, but they're all similar in the same way. I wouldn't, I'd take any of them, but I think quarterback is the hardest position in the world to evaluate. And I read something, I don't know what I was reading. You're going to get, even the best evaluators get half, we're, we're half, we're wrong half the time. Mm-hmm. And that's from the best, the best to tell you they're, they're wrong. Half. And a quarterback doesn't play out till three or four years down the road. No, sure. don't judge a draft till three or four years. Don't do any of that stuff. But, but at the end of the day, I think Burroughs, you know, Burroughs an interesting case of, of I got to find a place to play and I can do this. And if you surround me with talent, which I'm pretty sure LSU can still beat Cincinnati, but th- if you surround me with talent, I can, I can, uh, you know, I can show you what I'm worth. And, and that's exactly what he did. He also comes from a football family. You know, his dad was at Ohio. Was, I think the DC and resigned just because he wanted to watch him. So mm-hmm. he knows what it's about. Thanks. And I got uh, one more question. So I graduated um, from Rutgers with a degree in psychology. And towards the end of that is when I really started um, thinking about sports just in general, trying to get into sports. And so um, just kind of on the topic of sports psychology, I don't know. I just want to know kind of what your experiences have been with it 
and any trends that you've seen lately or any attitudes that, that you've kind of picked up on from, from coaching staffs, from coaching staffs and scouts about it. One thing I will say, Zach, and you probably already know this, but the NFL, almost all teams invest a lot in having, uh, in taking psychological tests. I mean, everyone knows about the Giants test. It's like 200 questions or whatever. Um, so many different ones that are out there. It's becoming a bigger part of the game for sure. Um, I don't know exactly how that dovetails in with your strengths, but I know it's part of the evaluation battery. So, you know, if you can sell that to teams as a talent that you have, a strength that you have, I think it could be a big advantage for you. Matt, what are your thoughts, man? My thoughts are I would almost want to hear what uh, Jalen and Marcus have to say about it from a college perspective because they're really developing – the, the man it, I, and I don't mean developing the man as the man but making taking the kid into a, a man that can then play in a, a man's game I is that I'm not trying to defer but I want to hear what they have to say because I think they, say, they have better yeah like a major part of our program is player development like and our, our, our player development is run by Kevin Glover who actually played in the NFL for 15 years yeah he love years oh man yeah. He's he's a he's a he's a Maryland grad and he played 15 years in the league and he came back and he's basically his only job has ever been at Maryland. So he runs our player development and he has the ear of our players for the most part because he's lived their dream already. So whenever they whenever he talks to them or whatever, they they're all ears. They 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 listen to him. But the the, the it's such a big problem now with uh, like I was saying earlier, it's just finding out if the kids are all in on being, you know, the whole process of being a great football player. It's just such, it's such an issue. And then there's so many things like when I was in college, it just, to me, it doesn't, you didn't have all the options and you didn't have all the, uh, you know, all the distractions. I guess that's the best way I can put it that the guys have now. Um, there was a major issue that not only us, but a lot of programs are having all over the country uh, with with weed smoke, it, it it was massive. Like it's just massive all over, and a lot of guys just don't understand. Younger guy, you 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 might it might be legal in some states, but in football, you just can't do it. Yeah. You, you can't. And um, you know, for whatever reason, some some guys were just having a struggle with with separating worlds, like having a, the ability of okay, I, I'm 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 a college football player that's aspiring to get my degree and then also aspiring to be in the NFL. But I got this other life of, 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 of girls and partying and all this kind of thing. And they couldn't, they can't separate the worlds. So what we try to do is, you know, do things that educate them and help them separate the worlds. But when it all comes down to it, it's, it's better if we find out if, if there are any issues up front. And that's been the hard part. And Neil, this is one of the things you're talking about being on the road in college. I would rather be on the road. It, 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 I would rather be on the road and find out all those things up front and kind of eliminate the guys that might have issues because this is what happens in college football, in my opinion, what that I've seen. So I'll put the guys on the road. So the coaches on the road, they'll get their certain areas to be on the road. They're trying to hit seven and eight schools in a day because they're trying to cover their area, but they don't spend enough time in the school talking to multiple people trying to get the information. They only talk to the coach. The coach is only going to tell you the good stuff. He's not going to tell you everything, you know, um, at least not all of them will. So I think if you had a guy like me that wasn't worried about beating the team on Saturday, if I went out on the road on Tuesday or Wednesday and go the guys that we're actually going to recruit and I can go talk to the janitor at the school, I can go talk to like three or four of his teachers. I can talk to the guidance counselor. I can sit down and interview the principal. I'm going to get to learn more about that kid and we won't make a mistake. We won't make as big a mistakes as we make because usually when you make a mistake, you don't make a mistake evaluation wise. You make the mistake with the character and with the work ethic and with all those, those the family issues or it, things that you don't. That's what you usually make the mistakes in the 12 years I've been in college football because you don't have a guy on the road that that's what he does. Great point. That's a great point. And, and Marcus, to your point, we don't, the NFL doesn't make that we make them, they make the mistake. We all make the mistakes on the care. We all make the mistakes on the, on everything you can't see. That's where, that is where mistakes are made. I and think, blinded. I think, 
if you can if you can know the problem beforehand, I think you got a better chance of attacking it with your player development people and with your your psychology people. You'll have a better chance of attack if you know it. But like what happens is we don't know it until they actually get to us. And that's what I think that's a major issue, not with just like with us in Maryland, but all over the country. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Jalen, do you have anything to add, man? Uh, yeah, most definitely. I would say, uh, I would say right now, especially in the day and age that we live in, um, people are definitely being more open about mental health, more open about what they're internally going through, and I think that. I think that sports, all sports, are really taking the taking a notice of it. I mean, I heard Rick Spielman talking about how they hired uh, a psychiatrist or some sort to, you know, help out with mental health and help those guys juggle all those mental and internal things. So I definitely think it's a premium right now, especially with social media and what's going on in the world. People are more sensitive. And they're more open now. So I definitely think it's a premium right now in terms of um, if, if that's your career or if that's your expertise. I definitely think people are um, open to it. And I definitely think people are seeing how how big of an impact that it has on someone's life, someone's life in terms of, you know, how good of a person they turn out to be and, you know, how it also can help them on the football field or whatever sport they're in. So I definitely think it's a premium right now. Okay. Okay. Thanks, man. Thank you, guys. Listen, guys, I told Matt a half hour. We're at the 94-minute mark now. So, <laughs> uh, I appreciate Matt um, being Oh, you're good. Here. Anytime. Thank I you, hope man. we got some questions answered for y'all. Um, I'm recording this. I'm probably going to post it somewhere so other people can benefit from it. The questions have been good. This has been fun. I hope I didn't bore y'all too much. I know Matt didn't. Um, I appreciate y'all buying my book. I appreciate y'all being friends. And uh, I look forward to working with you uh, further as we go forward. And um, y'all know how to reach me. I think we all follow each other on Twitter, so it's easy to get me. And my email address is in Stratton at InsideTheLeague.com. That was easy, too. Um, I will let y'all approach. I will distribute Matt's email address to y'all. Reach out to me, if you would, on Twitter or email or text or whatever you want. And I'll send it out to you, um, Matt. You put it in our group chat. I, okay. I I do have I do have Twitter. I just don't know really what I'm doing. So um, <laughs> nor do I. Look, yeah, right. So uh, look, remember that pre dead thing? Yeah, right. There you go. Uh, no, uh, I'm actually not that bad. But when you read my Twitter profile, you'll realize that uh, I like the movies Animal House and The Big Lebowski. So that's it. I've got the, I've got the dude. My picture. What is it? Avatar is the dude. And then I'll tell you what it says. It says, uh, uh, if you've ever seen Animal House, it says, I'm living proof that you can go through life fat, drunk, and stupid and still be successful. <laughs> Dean Wormer can kiss my ass. <laughs> Great movie. That I, maybe, Matt, you and I might be the only people on this call that have actually seen it. I, I know. That's the worst part is I, you know. <laughs> but, but look, I, t- I laugh, I joke, but I think I want you to all understand. I take it very, very seriously, but I, I think – I, you got it. What, what, what Neil said earlier, memorable. How are you going to be memorable? If you want a job, how are you going to be memorable? I guarantee you're all going to remember me now. <laughs> <laughs> With that, guys, I'm going to sign off. And, uh, Matt, and thank uh, you, everybody. Tell you, you guys. Thank you. Yeah, be blessed. Thank you. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Y'all further, okay? Have a great night. Thank Thanks you. a lot, guys. Be Have safe.